We're going to use two methods to find the impulse response. The first we've already talked about, which is to take the derivative of the step response, where the unit impulse is the derivative of the step function, and therefore the impulse response is the derivative of the step response. And here's just a quick example, x dot plus 2x is equal to u, where u is an input function which can be a step or an impulse. Let's first apply a step function, and we've already found uh, this sort of uh, response uh, before. Here it's 1 half minus 1 half e to the negative 2t. If we take the derivative of the step function, we get the impulse, and then if we take the derivative of the step response, we get e to the negative 2t. So this looks like a uh, familiar exponential decay where the uh, function has a value of 0 for time before 0, it jumps up to a value of 1, and then it decays exponentially with a time constant of 0.5. So that's the impulse response. The other method of finding the impulse response we've mentioned is the sudden change in initial conditions. Here, it's equivalent to having x take on two different values just before and then just after time equals 0, which we denote by 0 minus and 0 plus. And the question is, what is the instantaneous jump that happens in the initial conditions? Here's the procedure. We integrate both sides of the differential equation. We cross out all but the first term on the left, which is the n minus 1 derivative. On the right, the unit impulse just integrates to the unit step. We solve for the change in the n minus 1 derivative, and then that tells us the new initial conditions that we uh, use for our free response. So here's our, the same example as before, but now we're going to follow our procedure. When I say we're going to integrate over time, we're actually going to integrate between 0 minus and 0 plus. So it's a very short interval of time. That integral is just going to yield x between 0 minus and 0 plus, plus 2 times the integral from 0 minus to 0 plus of x dt, and that's got to be equal to the uh, unit step function 1. Uh, luckily, if x undergoes a step, the integral of x is actually going to undergo uh, no change over this short interval, and so this is just ends up being equal to 0. So as a result, we know that x of 0 plus is equal to x of 0 minus plus 1. We have 0 initial conditions before 0 minus, so this is just 0, so now we know that x of 0 plus is equal to 1. And then if we try to sketch this, notice that it looks just like the plot we just made. We have x taking on values of 0, and then at time 0, it jumps up to a value of 1, and then it decays with a time constant of 0.5. Here's another example that's more complicated. It's actually a third derivative, and we're given three initial conditions for x, x dot, and x double dot. And we've written in 0 minus as the initial condition, just to be clear about what time we're talking about. So what we expect immediately is this is a third order differential equation, and so we expect that the second derivative is going to have a sudden change in initial conditions. Well, when we integrate both sides, what we end up with is 3 times 1 on the right, and then on the left we're going to get 4x double dot evaluated between 0 minus and 0 plus, plus a bunch of other terms that I can just get away with ignoring. And so what we end up with is the relationship 4 times uh, x double dot at time 0 plus minus x double dot at time 0 minus quantity is equal to 3, which means that x double dot of 0 plus is just going to be equal to uh, the x double dot of 0 minus, which is negative 6, plus 3 fourths. So we end up with a negative 5.25. So we have a new set of initial conditions. Uh, there's no change in the other initial conditions. So x dot of 0 plus is just going to remain negative 7, and x of 0 plus is going to remain negative 8. So the interesting part was this part, the n minus 1th derivative changed. I'm not going to go through the free response, but that's what we would use, so we would use these initial conditions for the free response, and that would yield the impulse response.
and we're using all of these initial conditions. Why does this work? We said that the n-1 derivative has to undergo a unit step, and in fact it matches with what you see on the right-hand side of the equation. But what we don't know about is what happens to the other terms on the left-hand side of the equal sign. And the rule is that if you have one quantity that's undergoing a unit step, all lower derivatives, in other words, all integrals of that quantity, have to be smoother than a step. And if you integrate those over a time between 0 minus and 0 plus, you get no change. So generally, the more derivatives you take, the more you exaggerate sudden changes, and the more integrals you take, the more you smooth out sudden changes. A physical example of an impulse uh, uh, causing a change in the n minus 1 derivative is applying an impulsive force with a bat to a baseball. So the ball's velocity changes instantly. We have a second order differential equation and it's the uh, n minus 1 derivative, in other words velocity, that changes instantly. But the position doesn't change over the brief duration of that impulse. It only changes over a longer period of time as the ball gets carried away with its, uh, with its new vel velocity. Of course, the reality is pure impulses don't exist uh, because they require infinite force over uh, infinitesimal time. But the idea is just that the impulse is useful because we're interested in the integrated effect, in other words, a change in momentum in our system. And in fact, that's what we do when we use a, something like the coefficient of restitution to calculate an impact.